Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning or afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Red Hat Learning Subscription Webinar. Before we begin, I want to take a few minutes just to give you a brief overview of who we are here at Fierce, what you expect to learn today, and an introduction to our speaker, and how you can have access to additional training or any additional questions you have for this webinar. So Fierce is a small women-owned business specializing in reselling enterprise open source software for our public sector customers. Uh, specific value add elements that we bring are innovation brokering, license management, professional services, formal training, and custom technology enablement workshops. Perspective as a reseller means that we hear your goals and technology challenges and we respond with the perspective of our portfolio and not a single vendor solution. We love to bring innovation brokering, getting our customers access to the smartest people and the best technology we can find. We like to hear the, your entire challenge and then take ownership of finding our customers a complete solution. Um, in addition, we offer several other value adds. If you need professional services as a part of an installment or for ongoing access to professional enterprise, we work with vendor professional service teams and can build those out for you. This is both uncleared as well as cleared resources. We also provide access to formal training. Today, we're going to be talking about Red Hat training. Red Hat training is something we've provided for some time now. Today's webinar is an example of our technology enablement webinars. We design these uh, as free sessions to share best practices for implementation for your team. If you see some, anything that fits today, we'd love to follow up. If it wasn't a fit, we'd like to know how we can fill gaps for your specific needs. Um, today's this is, it's a humble brag of some of the awards that we have won in the past. Um, I'd like to put that out for us. We are proud to work with our public sector customers that have resulted in a full trophy case in such a short time. Let's take a look at what we expect to learn today from our webinar. It's a back to the basics look at containers and open ship via the Red Hat Learning subscription. In short, Red Hat Learning subscription helps fill Gap, skill gaps and address business challenges by taking advantage of unlimited access to the Red Hat comprehensive curriculum. And here is a brief introduction to our speaker today, Wes Urquhart. He is an associate solutions architect at Red Hat, covering all things Red Hat training and certification has to offer. Wes is active, actively pursuing multiple Red Hat certifications, but most enjoys conversations about integration and application development. If formal training is something that you and your team are looking for or to get your hands on, our new and improved Fierce web store has a vast showcase of many trainings, um, courses Red Hat offers. You'll be receiving an email from myself with all this information, um, so feel free to contact me after this webinar if there's something that you'd like to see fit with your team. In addition to training, please give feedback of what you liked about the webinar and what you'd like to improve for the next time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then pass it over to Wes. to get started. Thank you very much to my fierce colleagues for that introduction. Again, my name is Wes Urquhart. Uh, I'm a solution architect in the North America training team at Red Hat. I'm excited to be here today um, to talk to you all about the Red Hat learning subscription. And we're going to do that through a webinar called Contain This, a uh, back to basic looks at containers and OpenShift via the Red Hat learning subscription. So let's take a brief look at what we're going to cover today. So here's the agenda for today's session. Um, just to kind of go over at a high level, we'll talk about why we're here. So. Um, setting the scene for the conversation today. Uh, we'll talk about what are containers, sort of go way back to basics about containers and Linux. Um, and then from containers, we'll jump into OpenShift, right? Because Red Hat, the natural progression is containers and managing them with the OpenShift container platform. So we'll talk about that. And then the second half, we'll talk about where you start, right? So we'll talk about training and certification at Red Hat and sort of some learning paths that can jumpstart you on your container and OpenShift learning journey. And then we'll see it in action via a demo in the Red Hat learning subscription. So We'll jump into one of our newer courses and walk through an exercise in the lab and then open discussion at the end. Um, definitely feel free to post questions in the chat throughout. Um, we'll be in there answering those as we can. Um, if the question, it makes sense to answer kind of live, um, we'll do that in the chat. If not, we might hold it until the live Q&A at the end, which we'll leave plenty of time for. Should be 10 or 15 minutes live at the end um, for Q&A. So no worries there. With all that being said, let's dive in. 
So why are we here? Let's set the table a little bit. First, it's a back to basics review of containers, some container fundamentals. So containers, Linux, and why it all matters. And then we'll take that into an OpenShift overview. So folding containers into OpenShift and discussing why OpenShift is important kind of in that entire ecosystem and why OpenShift matters as opposed to just Kubernetes, right? And then we'll talk about getting started, right? So we'll dive into some training pathways, some ways you can start your learning journey, how you can get trained with Red Hat and Fierce. Um, and then we'll actually dive into the Red Hat learning subscription for a good chunk of this webinar. So stay tuned for that toward the end of, end of the discussion. So with that, let's dive into containers, right? So what are containers? Well, to understand containers, we really wanna go all the way back to Linux, right? Because you might see some Red Hatters wearing shirts occasionally that say containers are Linux. Now. You know, there are different flavors of containers these days as the technology evolves and matures, but still at its heart, at its core, containers are Linux is a very fair statement to make. So with that being said, containers start with Linux. So what's Linux? Linux is a family of free and open source software operating systems based on the Linux kernel uh, released in 1991 by Linus Torvalds. Um, Linux distributions are usually packaged together in a distribution or a distro for short. And this comes from the Linux newbie guide. Definitely recommend you check that out if you're interested um, in hearing about the anthology of Linux a little bit, a little bit of history, context for where it fits into the overall ecosystem of operating systems. But that's just what it is, right? It's an operating system, an open source operating system. So let's break down those two things. Open source, meaning the source code is there for everyone to work with. It's a community project where folks can contribute and kind of customize as need be and kind of make improvements for the good of good of the product or good of the project, so to speak. Um, and then it's an operating system. Well, what's an operating system? Operating system is the thing that sits between the hardware, the chips, the plastic, the metal inside your computer, inside your laptop, and your brain, right? So it's I'm inputting a message. And the operating system takes that message that I'm putting in, translates it for the hardware, and the hardware does what um, I want it to do, and then responds back to me, whether that's launching a program, typing some keystrokes, shutting down a program, turning on the computer, whatever it might be, the operating system is sitting between me and the hardware to make all of that stuff happen. And Linux is an example of an operating system. Windows is an example of an operating system. Mac OS, iOS, Android, all things that sort of handle those sorts of translations for you. So Linux is an open source operating system. Now, you might say it's open source. That's great. You just told me I can go and get the source code and I can download it completely free. So why Red Hat Enterprise Linux? Why pay for a Linux distribution? It's a great question. So first and foremost, you absolutely can. And I encourage you to go download the Fedora project if you're really interested in running Linux on your home machine. Uh, it's cool stuff, right? It's, it's Linux for the desktop. And for users, one or two people, that's perfectly fine, right? You can go download it and just sort of maintain it on your own system as you're kind of using it for leisure purposes or whatever have you. But when you're looking at it from a corporate or an enterprise point of view, or even a government point of view, you want something that's probably a little more consistent, right? Because when you look at an operating system or a, a, an open source sort of free operating system you just download, um, you're not necessarily knowing that it's fully patched. You're not knowing when the next update's gonna happen. You don't know what to expect in the next update, right? You don't know if you wanna take in that next update. Um, and you're also not necessarily supported, right? There are community forums you can go post on and ask questions, which are great and serve a lovely purpose, but for an enterprise, might not be the most sustainable model. So you wanna know that you can get support for your Linux distribution. That's where Red Hat comes in. We sort of put some guardrails around that open source distribution and make something that makes sense for the enterprise. So why RHEL 9? First and foremost, we certified it in the cloud, right? Everyone wants to run their ecosystems, at least in part, in a hybrid way, an open hybrid way, it's a different conversation, um, on you know, AWS, Azure, IBM, your own private cloud, OpenStack, your own sort of on-premise applications, your own other cloud applications. So you want to move your operating system and your various different pieces and parts in your ecosystem across clouds. We can do that. With RHEL 9, we're certified in the cloud with our, with our partners, so you can run RHEL wherever you want to, be it under your desk, be it out in your car on the edge, and you're gonna get a consistent, stable, and secure experience that's supported. Also security and compliance. I mentioned before, you know, if you wanna go download an operating system, that's great, but you're not sure you're compliant with every single thing. We help with that. At Red Hat, we sort of make sure as we're building the next release of Linux, including RHEL 9, um, of RHEL, I should say, our, the next release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, I should say, um, we make sure we cross check it with various compliance frameworks. So in this case, common criteria, FIPS 140-2, um, variety of other different compliance rules, right? We check across different governments. I think 
RHEL 9 actually released some compliance updates for the Australian government, right? So we're looking all around the world to make sure we're compliant wherever we can be. And kind of dovetailing it nicely into containers, we were the first container framework to support common criteria certification, which is pretty, pretty cool. And that actually kind of emerges nicely into support for emerging technologies, right? At one point, containers were emerging technology. We supported it. Linux is kind of putting a box around Linux, so to speak, putting some guardrails around to make you feel more comfortable, doesn't mean we're taking away any of the ability for you to innovate with it, right? We want it to be this place where emerging technologies can sort of come and, and kind of foster that innovation. So definitely be rest assured that being on the bleeding edge with RHEL is absolutely possible. And extended lifecycle support. I mentioned this before, you wanna be able to go get support from a person that can help you out. Red Hat's there for you to help you support um, your RHEL instance and ecosystem, wherever you may be. And you know that this instance of RHEL, RHEL 9 specifically, um, that you, if you were to go and put in RHEL 9 right now, you've got it for a 10 year life cycle and you can kind of see where in that life cycle things are going to happen. And you know you're supported to get patches and you don't necessarily have to jump to a completely different new release um, for, for a very long time. So that's some reasons to use RHEL. And now let's talk about containers. So we talked about Linux at the foundation. Now to understand containers, you really have to understand virtual machines. So what's a virtual machine? So let's go back to my example of the operating system on your computer, right? Your computer is a set of chips and a set of hardware that also runs with a set of software, right? That operating system is kind of giving instructions to the pieces and parts in your computer to do the various actions, right? If I click on Google Chrome, it launches Google Chrome. That took a combination of hardware and software, right? And then there's other software as well beyond the operating system, right? That Google Chrome app, for example, a mail app, a chat app, Telegram app, whatever have you, there's a variety of different softwares and hardwares, right? That's your laptop, that's your machine. It's a combination of software and hardware. A virtual machine is an exact replica of the software that runs on your computer, but running on the same hardware. What does that mean? Right now, my computer is running a, a slide presentation, um, a meeting app with a screen share, and maybe a couple of different things in the background. But I doubt I'm using the hardware of my laptop to its fullest capacity. I'm probably using maybe 20%, let's say for a round number, of what my computer could be doing at any given time. Well, that's a lot of wasted computing potential. So what I could do is run a virtual machine and basically run five instances of that software at 20% to reach 100%, right? Have five different machines all running on one set of hardware, which five different machines, five different people that can be using it, five different purposes. That sounds great, right? Even more so, if it gets corrupted or goes down, one of them, your laptop remains unharmed, right? You're still back up and running, you spin up a new machine and you move on, right? But as, as you can kind of guess, Every single time I need one of these machines, I don't necessarily need that mail app. I don't necessarily need those web browsers. I don't necessarily need that messaging app. Maybe I just want to use the virtual machine to stand up a SQL database. Well, I'm going to have a lot of unnecessary load on that machine based on the exact copy of all the operating system pieces and parts, all the different programs. So it's going to be running a lot of unnecessary stuff for a very niche purpose. And so that complete copy, as I keep running more and more of them, and in this case, nesting them, which is a bad idea, um, you're eventually going to exceed the overall computing power of the hardware in the underlying machine at the very beginning of the chain, and then the whole thing comes crashing down. So what's the solution for that, right? So let's use an analogy to luggage, right? A, a situation that uh, everyone has really encountered, your family's traveling, and there's a limit to how much a combined luggage can weigh, right? I think in the US, domestically, it's 55 pounds for a big bag, right? So your option one is one large check bag, right? So that's a good thing. You have more space in one piece of luggage, right? This one big piece of luggage, bunch of space. I can put a lot of stuff in there, but if I'm traveling with my wife, I have to coordinate what I'm packing with her and make sure that you know we're both packing the appropriate numbers of pairs of shoes. It's equitable, kind of split correctly. And if my toiletries explode, say my toothpaste explodes and it goes everywhere, that's an everybody problem, right? It's not just a me problem, it's everybody's stuff that's in that suitcase, right? And we're all kind of unhappy. Option two is multiple small carry-ons, right? I could have my roller board and my wife could have her roller board. It's more luggage to keep track of, right? Right now we're at two pieces. If you had a family of four, you're at four pieces, right? But I can pack whatever I want pack whatever she wants. We don't have to check with each other, except to the extent that we're sort of coordinating the idea of what weather is going to be at the destination where we're going to. But other than that, right, we can pack whatever we want to. 
And if my toiletries explode, if my toothpaste explodes, that's just a me problem, right? It's isolated to my suitcase, not everybody else's. Everyone else can go about their merry business while I figure out what to do with my clothes and how to get them clean um, and what I might need to replace. Option one is that virtual machine. That's that big piece of checked bag luggage. It's more powerful as a single unit. You can get more people into one of them, right? You can run a complete copy of your computer. So you can do more with it just in terms of it being bigger, but more resource intensive construction means more sharing, right? We all have to share because there can be less of them. So maybe developer A and developer B both have to be in the same virtual machine. That might mean unnecessary features and more users increase risk of your breakages. Developer B might need to download the latest version of Python to run their new application or to build their new application. Developer A might be relying on the older version. Suddenly we've got a conflict and someone's thing is going to break, right? And then no one's gonna be happy. So it enters containers, right? There's more agile construction, means there'll be more volume to manage. Everyone's gonna want their own container. There's gonna be more to deal with. We'll put that aside. We'll solve that problem in just a minute. But on the pluses, you're only using essential resources, which makes them quick, flexible, and abundant. I just am using the bare minimum processing, securing, and you know, computing that I need to run a SQL database if that's what I want to do in my container, or run a mail server, right? It can do the one thing really well and doesn't really need to do anything else. It is just the minimum that you need, and it's taking full advantage of your underlying hardware. And containers are isolated. Right. If mine crashes, it doesn't. If, if I'm developer B and my crash my container by uploading a patch, that doesn't affect uh, developer A. Right. They can still run their container. And as developer B, frankly, I could just go spin up another one. No big deal. Containers are kind of meant to be ephemeral. You know, go up and go away as you don't need them. So really, crashing a container, being able to bounce one to the next one, especially in a development situation, uh, is not that big of a deal. So if the drawback is there's more to manage, OpenShift can help you manage the volume of containers in a user-friendly way. Uh, more on that shortly, right? First though, let's dig into a little bit more of the weeds of containers and Linux. So when we say containers are Linux, right? So first and foremost, Linux is foundational containers. Containers run on a Linux container host OS. So you've got these containers here, right? Each of these three on the left. On top of that, right? Where are they coming from? What are they running on top of? A Linux host somewhere, right? In this case, OpenShift and Nibby Rel Core OS, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but even further than that, containers depend on Linux features, right? That build of that container might not contain a lot of things that it needs to do, but there are things it needs to do. And that's a Linux OS and user space defined in every container. And then apps are running on top of that Linux, right, within that container. So my website, my WordPress app, or my mail server app is running on top of Linux in that container. And then you've got Kubernetes there used to manage resources. Kubernetes is the open source project that kind of is helping manage and organize different containers and do different things. It has its limitations, but it's there and it's super helpful. Um, and a lot of folks do use it. And RHEL is the leading Linux for the enterprise, which we talked about already. So if we look at all this stacked up, right, when I say containers are Linux, it's because Linux is all throughout this stack of containers, right? It's the containers themselves are running Linux, the apps are running Linux on top of the, the Linux within the container, and then there's Linux underneath it all. There's Linux, Linux, Linux everywhere. So that's why we're saying that, that Linux, our containers are Linux in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, there's definitely other options there to caveat, right? Especially kind of as new things emerge. Uh, but for, for the purposes of this conversation, um, that's the truth we're going to kind of thrust. So moving right along, I talked about Kubernetes a bit. I talked about OpenShift a bit. Well, what is OpenShift? I'm going to use another analogy. Hope you're not tired of them yet. So consider a stove or a range, an oven, right? So let's start from bottom up. The first thing when you're looking to buy a stove or you're looking at a stove or you're looking at a range or an oven is the brand, right? Do I want an LG? Do I want a Samsung? Do I want a Wolf? Do I want a Viking? Right? I look around and see what brand I might use. I might consider what power source I'm using, right? And is it electricity or is it gas? I might consider what I have in my house, but at the end of the day, the brand is going to have an option for me one way or another. Um, so it's it's not necessarily, it's a factor, but it's not really a limiting factor when choosing between brands. But price matters quite a bit, right? How much am I willing to spend? And brand loyalty, right? I might be very loyal and I might have already in my kitchen a bunch of different LG appliances. So maybe I get an LG because I want to keep everything matching. And maybe it'll give me a price break if I buy all of it at the same time. Keep that in mind. Power. This is the gas or the electricity, right? 
there's other factors that play into this choice, but you just kind of use what you have. The controls, right? So when you're looking at your oven or your stove, you've got the various burner knobs on there to control how high the heat is on the BTUs um, or the electric, how hot it's getting. And then you've got the oven there and see how, how hot is the oven temperature gonna be and using the broiler, all that kind of stuff. You've got one central location there for all your controls. Now on top of that, you've got burners, right? So little isolated areas that are a certain heat, right? I can have burner A set to a really high heat and burner B set to a really low heat. Uh, but I can never really go hotter than what the stove can output, right? So there are probably certain stoves that can get hotter than others based on what you buy. Um, I'm limited to what I have in the stove, right? The power under the hood. But food goes on top of the burners, right? I can still make whatever I want in an isolated way, right? So I can, in burner A, I can be uh, hot um, sauteing some vegetables, right? And in burner B, maybe I'm stewing some fish. I might want to reverse those as a chef. I might want to do high heat on the fish and low heat on the veggies, but either way, you get the point. They're two separate things. And I'm really only limited up to the pan space that I have and that burner area that I have. Otherwise, the world is kind of my oyster when it comes to preparing the different foods that I want to. So how does that relate to OpenShift, right? And I probably did nothing except make you hungry. Well, let's talk about OpenShift. The brand is the infrastructure, right? It's where you want to run OpenShift. We don't, from an OpenShift point of view, it's not a limiting factor, right? Do you want to run in under your desk on premise? No problem. Do you want to run out on the edge? No problem. Do you want to run in AWS public cloud or in Azure public cloud, an IBM public cloud, Google public cloud? No problem. Do you want to run a managed service? Sure, you can do that too. That's a different conversation, but it's one worth having if you're looking at OpenShift. Um, or do you want to run in your own private cloud like OpenStack? Yep, no problem, right? OpenShift is there for you to be wherever you want. The, the limiting factors to consider as you're selecting a brand are, do I have any partnerships already? Much like I might have all LG appliances in my kitchen, right? Maybe I am an Azure shop and I want to put everything in Azure, or maybe I'm an AWS shop. And I want to put everything in AWS and they'll give me a price break because I already have a partnership with them or money I'm committed to spend. That's certainly a factor there when you're picking where to run OpenShift. RHEL Core OS, which I mentioned earlier, is the power source, right? This is what's underneath OpenShift. It is an immutable operating system. You can't really log into it. It's there solely to run um, OpenShift, right? And, you know, there's Kubernetes on top of that as well. We'll talk about Kubernetes and where it plays in in just a minute. And then the OpenShift console, to go up a layer or two, um, is the controls, right? So the ability to kind of log into OpenShift and point and click around to see, you know, what is the status of all of my containers? Maybe I can up the CPU request on this container, lower the request on this container, expose these routes, not expose these routes, see what's live, what's not. That's your control plane, right? The OpenShift console. And then the containers themselves are the burners, right? One container can be running at a very high load and one can be running barely anything, right? I can be developing over here. I can be running production over here, right? I mean, that's probably not exactly the right use case, but you get my point. That's different clusters probably. But um, the idea is you can be doing two different things in different containers. And then the apps I'm developing are the food, right? So I can be doing a Java thing over here. I can be doing a SQL thing over here. Doesn't really matter. They're isolated. That's the idea. So here it is in a much more sort of a techie kind of fashion. I mentioned I'd come back to Kubernetes in a minute and I will. Uh, there's Kubernetes there in the center, right? So there's RHEL Core OS underneath here. And then you've got all the different pieces and parts with OpenShift. Kubernetes is, is an engine that kind of helps run and orchestrate within OpenShift. Um, as you can see though, OpenShift is more than just Kubernetes, right? Kind of putting it together. But you might ask yourself, hey, you know, why do I need OpenShift? If Kubernetes is there and it's open source, right? And it can help me orchestrate my containers and container frameworks are open source, right? why would I need OpenShift? Well, it's a great question. So let's talk about this. Juggling dependencies, updates, and vulnerabilities in a vast and ever-changing ecosystem. You're not just gonna have Kubernetes when you're running your container platform. You're gonna have a lot more tools. So first and foremost, you're gonna have your base OS, right? Which is your Linux. You're gonna have Kubernetes you have to consider, which is every ish 90 days release cycle. And then your different cloud providers that may be doing different patches, depending on how complicated your ecosystem is, right? These are not necessarily all going to be in sync, right? You might have a new release of one of these things that does not work on the other or is not technically compatible or has not been tested yet. Um, you want to make sure if you're going about this by yourself, you take a very, very disciplined approach to how you maintain everything um, to make sure it's updated, patched, and everything works together very well. It's tricky, as you might guess. And just to sort of give some context a little bit into 
what happens with OpenShift and with the overall community, this is just how much happens, right? How much goes on. So 21.6 million lines of code with 4,000 different committers in the project, um, 230 changes a day, 6,340 bugs, right? And then over two years, 33% of the base code has changed. These numbers are just basically meant to give you an idea of upstream how much is happening and how quick it happens, right? It's great. Innovation happens at the, at the flip of a switch, um, but you don't necessarily want to take all those innovations in immediately, right? You may want to wait for them to harden a little bit. You may not have a compatible um, OS to run with those new changes or, or some such difference or some such conflict there. So you want to make sure that you're understanding what's happening upstream, but you may not want to manage it yourself. So how do we help you? We turn container technology into an enterprise software. Right, so OpenShift is not just Kubernetes. OpenShift is a an ecosystem, frankly, of different tools that we sort of line up the dependencies for as a release and say this set of tools works together. Right, updated, uh, in sync, and they go together. So Kubernetes, Istio, Cree.io, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera cryo, sorry, um, Prometheus, all that lovely stuff um, kind of bundles into the OpenShift container platform. And we have 15 years of experience making open source technologies ready for the enterprise trust red hat i think it's even more than 15 years at this point but yeah and we're also not just taking from the community i think this is a really important point to, to kind of sit on for a second we're also contributing right red hat is a major contributor to a lot of these open source projects be that employees actually here to work on them or be that employees doing it in their free time right Red Hat has given resources to these projects and has worked on a lot of these projects. So we're not there just to take from the community. Uh, we're there to work with the community together and kind of help with changes upstream and then sort of kind of assess what makes sense for the enterprise and package it, right? So that's just a, that is just a, uh, a brief sort of point I wanted to make um, worth mentioning. We're not just consumers there. So we've talked about containers. We've talked about Linux. We've talked about OpenShift. Now you want to get started. Where do you do that? with Red Hat training and certification, of course, right? So, and with Fierce Software, our friends. So multiple ways to learn, right? So we offer a variety of different modalities, right? If you wanna learn, there are different ways to do it. There are different styles of learning. The first, live scheduled or instructor led, right? All of this is live kind of training with an instructor. So you wanna work with an instructor, you wanna have a dedicated time set aside of a few days, you wanna do all of it together, you wanna do a training, you wanna sit and allocate a week of your time for training, great. We have a couple of options to that effect, open enrollment or a private delivery. Um, open enrollment is a schedule that's online. You can just go sign up, best for kind of one or two off folks on your, in your organization or your team, or if you're just a single student that wants to take a class, um, go look at the calendar and enroll and, and off you go, right, in a virtual way. Or a private delivery, right? If you're part of a larger team that wants to get together and have a dedicated time with an instructor to do a delivery, um, we're there for you with that too, right? It can be uh, on site, we can have an instructor come to you, or we can obviously do it virtual, which is much more common these days as teams are kind of more and more spread out. It can be a good uh, a good reason to get everyone together though. Training can be a very good catalyst to bring teams that have kind of evolved apart during um, the last few years back together to one central location to sort of share a space, share time, um, and share different perspectives through a training. But um, if you're not someone that wants to sit in a class for a week um, or a few days on your schedule, right? Self-paced in a variety of different ways. So um, self-paced training, first and foremost, just taking a class a la carte, uh, 90 day access. These trainings that are self-paced um, have videos that are recorded and instructors in a studio recording specifically for that course. Um, and of course, there's a course book, right? Text if you prefer to read. Um, and then of course, there's labs, right? Guided exercises and labs, which we're gonna look at in a little bit, sort of get hands on with it. Uh, just note that all of our courses, be they live or be it on your own schedule, um, are about 50-50 lecture to lab. So you're gonna get your hands on the keyboard no matter what course you take. Um, the other option in terms of self-paced is the Red Hat Learning Subscription, which is what we're here to talk about and what we're gonna use in our demonstration here in a little bit. Um, which is basically take all of those self-paced courses and put them into a, a package, then you get a full access to everything, right? Um, all our Red Hat online learning courses kind of go together so you can have access to the videos, the course books, and the labs for all of our courses that are in the self-paced modality, which is basically 60 plus courses. Um, it's basically everything save like two courses, I think, that are only taught um, live. So great stuff and there's various tiers of the learning subscription as well um, which you can certainly work with us or your, our partners at fierce to sort of sort through what makes the best sense for you 
Certification, um, there are a variety of different ways to test. Um, the left side of this is talking more about uh, with a group. Um, it used to be very common for an instructor to give a class for four days and then certify or have everyone take a certification test on the fifth. Um, as you know, the world has evolved a little bit and we're doing a lot more virtual deliveries, it is far more common for folks to take some time after they take the course, you know, sit on the material, think about it, practice it a little bit, and then want to take the exam. And that sort of has led to an uptick very much in individual exams, which is the right side of this. Um, individual exams take two flavors. You can go to a testing center or take it remote at home. Um, a testing centers, just to be fully transparent, um, the pandemic closed a lot of them and we're struggling to get a lot of them back open, but we're working hard to open as many as we possibly can. Um, with that being said, we recognize that a remote exam is not perfect for everybody, so we really want to push uh, to get as many testing centers open as we can. So if you've got one in your area and you want to use it, please go ahead and feel free. If you're interested in taking an exam at a testing center um, and you can't find one in your area, reach out to us and we'll see what we can try to find. With that being said, remote exams are the more popular option these days where you can take it from the comfort of your home, right? I understand everyone doesn't necessarily have a dedicated space or reliable internet, but if you do, um, remote exams are, are a great way to go. And it has been successful for a large number of our, of our students or our candidates. So uh, it's definitely a viable option to consider. Uh, worth noting, if you're interested in taking a remote exam, uh, the instructions and sort of what you have to complete in order to do so are not difficult, but they are detailed. So definitely take the time a week, two weeks before your exam, you know, read over the email you get about the compatibility check, make sure you set up your laptop, download the ISO image to your USB, make sure you can boot in, do all of those things to make sure on test day you log in and there's no hiccups with the process and you can focus just on the material of the exam because the exams are all hands-on um, and they're difficult. So keep that in mind. Okay. Oh, and there's a video linked there as well. Um, our certification team did a, a great job of posting a kind of a sample, what to expect inside the lab environment or inside the certification environment rather um, when you kind of jump in. So definitely worth checking out. All right, so let's actually talk about the courses you can take. So we're gonna focus on our OpenShift curriculum, surprise, surprise. And we have two separate tracks, OpenShift administrators and OpenShift developers. Um, and there's some crossover there. It kind of depends on who the persona is at your given organization. You might fit into either one. So definitely kind of look at the material, but for the most part, we split our curriculum into those two paths. Um, this is the administration side of the house. So just to give you a brief orientation of the slide, um, it goes from the top down with some uh, additional commentary on the left, like the experience and sort of some notes on what we focus on. Um, and of course the name of, of the path on the top left. Um, the only thing to, to other to note with the colors is the teal color coding is an exam that's associated with a course. Don't worry about the other colors for the purposes of this conversation. So uh, worth mentioning to start, uh, DO080 is where this path starts. Um, it's our Red Hat OpenShift technical overview. We have technical overviews um, for free on training.redhat.com. We might have a, a partner page with Fierce as well, but I'm sure um, they'll jump in and give the link for it if we do. Um, and these are all, you know, two to three hours worth of videos on a variety of different products and topics, completely free. You just have to give your name and your email address and it kind of logs you in. I think you get access for like 60 or 90 days or something like that. Um, and it just kind of takes you through the basics, the foundational building blocks of what's a container, what's Kubernetes, what's OpenShift, right? Makes sense. From there, we actually start digging into the real longer classes, the stuff with labs, the stuff that is, you know, anywhere from three to five days um, in a classroom type of material. So we're talking 30 to 40 hours worth of material here. So it starts with DO180, which is our Red Hat OpenShift 1 containers and Kubernetes course. Um, right now, this course is focused on primarily running command line containers with Podman. If you're a Docker person, Podman, Docker, very similar. So it's, you know, how do I, you know, spin up a container? Um, how do I read a container file or Docker file? How do I build one? Um, how do I deploy an app onto OpenShift? How do I troubleshoot? How do I grab some logs? And then some basic OpenShift console navigation. Now, this course is worth noting um, that it will undergo a, a substantial update in a couple of months time um, to kind of be a little bit larger and sort of focus a little bit more on kind of operating in a Kubernetes, in a, an OpenShift environment, right? So more tier one support type stuff. So more console information um, than there is in this course currently. So if you're interested in that kind of training on OpenShift, sort of the basic survival skills in the, not just in the command line, but also in the console, um, keep an eye out for that update to 4.12 um, where there's some good changes coming. DO280 is the level two 
operating a production Kubernetes cluster, which right now is all things sort of OpenShift administration, configuration, um, security and authorization, uh, logs, monitoring a little bit. So that kind of thing is in that DO280 course. Um, it will change slightly as well with the update to the 180. Um, it will become much more about administering and managing. Um, and the 0180 will become much more about being kind of in there as an operator. Take both of those and it leads you into EX280, which is the Red Hat Certified Specialist in OpenShift Administration, if you want to get certified. And then DO380 is the OpenShift Administration 3 course, scaling your deployment, and then EX380 is the associated course. So that's our administrator side. For developers, um, two technical overviews, which are the free trainings, are available online at training.redhat.com. And from there, you jump into DO188, which is Red Hat OpenShift 1, um, Introduction to Containers with Podman. This is mostly a command line focused running containers with Podman course, which makes sense based on the description of the course, the name of it. So you'll jump in, you know, you'll build containers, you'll understand the difference between a container and a virtual machine, um, you'll understand what's in a Docker file or a container file, uh, you'll understand how to network between containers, create networks, some basic storage concepts, some basic logging and troubleshooting concepts, but mainly focus on containers with just like this much OpenShift. Um, then you can take EX188, which is the Certified Specialist in Containers exam. Um, and then it goes to DO288, which is our level two, all things containerizing applications. So now that you know how to use a container, let's talk about, you know, uh, building an app within a container or containerizing an app that does not exist in the container already or uh, deploying that, that app onto OpenShift, right? So all those pieces and parts and then EX288 there for you if you want to get certified. So that's the OpenShift admin and developer track for starters. There are many more courses on OpenShift available in the learning subscription, which we're gonna see in just a second. Uh, but just know that that is the basic bedrock course. Please feel free to throw questions in the chat. Um, but with that said, let's see it in action. So this is an RHLS or Red Hat Learning Subscription focused webinar. So let's actually dive into the Red Hat Learning Subscription. So we're gonna use RHLS. And we're going to spotlight our DO188 course, the one we were just talking about, OpenShift Development 1, Introduction to Containers with Podman. We're going to look at Chapter 2 for some Podman basics, and we're going to jump right in. Know that the goal here is not to give you a thorough review of uh, how these courses are, or what, what is in these exercises. It's more about giving you a kind of a peek into the learning subscription, a peek into some of the things you might learn in the course. Um, you're, not going to walk, want to, you're not going to walk away mastering those two sections, um, but we definitely wanted to give you some insights into what the course looks like. So with that said, let me go over here and we're in the learning subscription. So this is the Red Hat Learning Subscription homepage. Excuse me, losing my voice. So when you log into the homepage, you will see any courses that you are actively working on and any skills paths you're actively enrolled in, right? So you scroll down, you see I've got a lot of stuff going on. That's primarily because I do a lot of demonstrations and people ask a lot of questions. So I, I, I kind of tend to start a lot of courses and not finish all of them necessarily. Um, if you want to see some statistics about your individual account, you'll see them here, right? So many days you have left, how many lab hours you've used. We'll talk about that in a little bit and exams and student guide downloads as well. If you want to just get a look at all of the courses that we have to offer, the catalog page is there for you. So let's just say I wanted to filter over here on all of my OpenShift courses, I can do so, right? And see a variety of different courses in here. I can open it up and see the description. I can see what version the latest one is running on. And then I can actually jump in and launch it. So that's a way to kind of go through. You can also sort of uh, uh, you know, filter it on delivery format if you wanted to see exams or different categories like DevOps. So variety of different ways and languages, right? If you wanna take it outside of, of English, you know, there's a variety of different languages available for most of our courses too. So that's a way to kind of look around. If you're interested in skills paths, right? Beyond what we just talked about, say you wanna learn about, you wanna learn how to get your Red Hat Certified System Administrator certification. So if you go to Linux, right? Red Hat Certified System Administration path, RH124, RH134, EX200, kind of lines everything up there for you. Let's say you want to do that for OpenShift, right? And let's say you want to manage containers and Kubernetes infrastructure, right? DO180, EX180, which is now retired, by the way. So that's why you see it. I, I completed it before it was retired, but it's retired now. And then DO280 and then EX280, right? So you can kind of go through these paths and enroll, which is a really cool way to see it. 
There's some other features of RHLS too. For the purposes of time, I'm only going to go into one or two more. Um, early access, I think, is really cool, where you can see courses as they're being developed, whether that's a new version of a course or a net new course. Um, as things are materially ready, our developers will post them in here. Um, that could be just the skeleton of the course itself. That could be a chapter or two. Just note that we're open to feedback on these. These are not final. So don't look at it and say, oh, this is what this looks like. This is the final version. No, things can absolutely change, especially when a course is early on in the development cycle. Um, things can definitely change quite a bit. So keep that in mind as you kind of peruse early access. So with that being said, let's actually dive into one of the courses here. Let's jump into DO-188. Let's kind of look around a little bit. So when you first jump in, you'll see a variety of different sort of pieces. So you see the title there, and then you can go to different translations over here. You can download the ebook. If there's a different version of the course, you'll see it over here. Um, this course is relatively new, so it's still just on the one version, but for courses that have been around a while, you might see like RH124, for example, which is our Linux sysadmin course. Um, there's probably a version 8.2 in there. There's version 9. There's probably still a version 7 in there too. For how long, I'm not sure, but it's probably still there. And then we actually drive down into the material. So the first thing you'll see is a table of contents, which is the outline of the course, right? So basically just walks you through all the chapters and what you're gonna take. As you sort of look around, you're gonna start seeing a bunch of prefixes here. So first, this is like a lecture, right? So creating containers with Podman. And then you see guided exercise, quiz, and lab. So what the differences between those are, so a quiz is what it sounds like, just multiple choice, true, false, matching, right? Just to see if you got the concepts from what we were talking about in the previous lesson. A guided exercise in a lab are where you actually get your hands on the keys with our lab environment, which we host, by the way. That's a common question we get. Um, what kind of hardware do I need to run your lab environment? A computer that can hold a stable internet connection with a modern web browser will do you just fine. Um, we handle all the hosting on our side. So a guided exercise will kind of take you through from beginning to end, kind of hold your hand through, you know, sort of cementing the concept you just learned in the previous chapter or section, I should say. And the lab is where we take the training wheels off at the end of the chapter and we say, hey, um, you've learned quite a bit in this chapter. Now go try your hand at it with a lab and see how you do, right? Grade it. Um, and then there's also what we call the comprehensive review at the end of every course, which is effectively a collection of labs. So a collection of a lengthier, hey, try what you learned in this course out, right? This is a great way to prepare for exams too, by the way. Okay, so let's actually dive into 2.6. Right, so the first thing you'll see, you'll be greeted with the video classroom. This is, in the case of the exercises and labs, the instructor going through them. In the case of the actual sections, it's the instructor giving you the course, teaching it, right? If you want to see the text, you can scroll down or collapse that, which I just did. One second, folks. Sorry there, still dealing with the frog in my throat. Had to clear it a little bit. So when you actually look at the exercise, um, you can see the objective, so the outcome, you should be able to understand how DNS works in Podman networks. And then you have a start script and a bunch of different steps. And as you work through those different steps, it tells you what to expect. Let's actually log into the lab environment real quick and let's actually take a look. I'm looking at the time right now. We're doing all right. I won't spend too long in here. Um, this is the lab environment. Uh, when you first come in here, you'll have to click create um, to get all these virtual machines to spin up. Um, once you do that, this acts a little bit like a video game save file in that you've got the stop and the destroy timers. So the stop timer is like hitting pause, it just sort of suspends everything. You don't lose any progress, but you will have to start it back up to spin it back up. It just takes a minute. The destroy feature will wipe the file completely and will have to recreate new labs from beginning and any work you have in there will be lost. Now, that's not really that big of a deal in the case of our labs because we have catch-up scripts, which you can basically jump into any exercise at any time and kind of start from where you were. So no harm done if you lose the labs. It's more of a nuisance than anything else. So let's actually dive in. And the first thing you'll see is that this screen is a little small. Once I log in, my preferences are such that it should expand, right? And that's because I went into the display setting and set the resolution. So first tip, when you come into the lab environment, make sure you're set up for your monitor, go into displays and set up the resolution. So now I'm gonna open up the terminal window and I'm actually also gonna open up an instance of RHLS so we can look side by side. And I don't necessarily do this every time I'm coming in to learn. It does just kind of depend. Oh, there we go, perfect, it's already open for me, sweet. So. 
but I'm gonna scroll down here. It, lo it works great for demos to do the side by side, so I typically do. Um, perfect, this is where I wanna be. Excellent, so you run the start script. Let me zoom in a little bit over here. So lab start basics accessing. This is what I was talking about with the catch up script. So this just makes sure everything is where it needs to be. And it will make sure. Great. And then I log in and I kind of start doing a few different things. So in this case, it wants me to run a container, right? Okay, let's do that. So um, for the sake of time, I'm looking at the clock. I'm just going to copy this. I recommend you actually type all these out. You will cement your learning better. But for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to do that. And then we'll see a container. And then it wants me to navigate to localhost 8080 in my internet browser once this is running. And it says I should be found with an, a 404 not found. So let's do that, localhost 8080, 404 not found. And this exercise is actually going to take me through the process for getting this fixed, checking the error log, looking at what it's saying, understanding what's coming from the container, and then fixing the issue, resolving it, and going all the way through until you can actually see the screen. And it's gonna take me through that every step of the way. I'm not gonna do that here because I think that might take a little while and I wanna take a little bit of time for the lab before we jump into Q&A. Um, but for the most part, you're gonna kinda get that SEM cadence where you start with a, this is what we're going to do, and let's go through it every single step of the way and cement the learning that you did from the previous section. At the end of every guided exercise, there's a finish script, much like there was a start script. Okay. And what it'll do is just clean up our work to put everything back where we found it to make sure we're good to come in here for the next exercise. In this case, the next exercise is a lab, which again, like I mentioned, end of chapter labs are meant to test your knowledge. So the goal is to see what you can do without looking at the answers. The answers are there for you in case you get stuck, but obviously you'd like to do your best to see what you can do without those answers. So in this lab, you should be able to do these things. So manage local containers, copy files in and out of containers and the rest. And then there's a lovely preamble that explains to you a little bit about the lab setup. Read that when you're actually doing the exercise. For the purposes of this, we're gonna jump down to the start. Okay, great. And in this case, this lab actually shows a live uh, version of checking my work, right? Right now, if you see the bottom here, I don't know if you can see that, zero passing and eight failing. So it is live checking against how I'm doing. So let's actually jump in and start one of the exercises. So the lab command starts the basics podman secret container, which contains that file. Copy that file from the container to the solution file. Okay. So Let's say I'm thinking back to how to use the podman copy command, and I don't remember how to use it. Well, I have access to the man pages, right? So I can do man podman cp. And I can scroll down and I can read all about it. So let's just see. I know I need to use podman copy, but maybe I just don't remember the syntax, right? And what I'm doing here is I'm copying a file from a container to a file on my machine. So to file from a do to do, copy the contents to do file from host to a container, from a container to a directory, from a directory, uh, directory on a container to a directory on the host, right? So CP, container ID, file path, file pathway. So let's do that. I'll open a new tab. So it's podman, CP, the name of the container is basics podman secret, and the file pathway is Etsy secret, file and I'm putting it in home, which is the tilde, you know, 188 labs, basics, podman, solution. Great. And now let's see how I did. Now, if you come over here, one passing. Great. So now I know I'm doing that right. And if I just want to check to see if I got everything right, it's going to take me through it a slightly different way. But that's the beauty of this. It's not checking how you did it. It's checking, did you get it done? So I didn't bother to check to see the file pathway. I just took the exercise at its word to make sure it was where it was. They went through every single step and said, hey, go look, look into the container, see where the file pathway is. 
that's probably a more uh, a more accurate practice. But in my case, what I did seemed to have worked just fine. So I'm happy with that. Let's move on to the next step. So the next step is to start a new container with these parameters, right? Okay. So first and foremost, it wants me to use a network. Well, I'm willing to bet you that I need to create that network. But let's check. So I've got, oops, hold on. Network exists. I'm sorry, Podman Network LS. This is the beautiful, this is the beauty of playing in these um, in these lab environments, as you can see, sort of live test. I was just going to run the Podman networks. I thought that would give me the list. It didn't. I thought maybe it was uh, network uh, exists. That's not it. But it gave me this this prompt. Network LS gives me the list. Now I see the list of networks, and I see that the network lab net, which I need to use my container, is not there. So I need to create it. So let's do Podman network create and it's lab.net. And I would have learned a lot of these skills in the previous couple of chapters, right? So I'm testing myself. Okay, now it wants me to create a container. So I know it's podman run dash D for detached mode, and then dash dash name equals whatever it wants it to be. Basics, podman server, make sure you're spelling everything right. And then it wants me to do some port forwarding. 8080, right, it wants me to forward uh, 8080 on my machine to 8080 in the container. So that's easy. They're both the same. And then it wants me to use the network, uh, the one I just created, which is lab.net. Great. And then it wants me to use registry.ocp4.example.com843. Oops. I like my number pad. That's okay. 8443. UBI8. HTPD dash 24. And you're seeing it's pulling that base image of that container, which is the minimal amount of stuff it needs in order to run exactly what I'm looking to run, like we talked about. This is how quick you can spin up containers. This is one of the value adds of containers versus virtual machines. They're fast, right? And all of a sudden that container's up and running. And I can check to see if it's up and running by running the podman ps command. And lo and behold, I've got a couple containers. I've got the basics in this, let me move this over so you can see a little bit better. Make it full screen. There we go. I've got two containers up and running. I've got the Podman basic secret, which was at startup of the lab, and then the one I just created. So now I know the container's working, that's great, but let me check the grading script to see how I'm doing. Five passing, three failing. I just passed five of them with that one script. Okay, now copy that file into that file so let's do that so just like before we'll do podman copy so podman cp and in this case i'm copying something from my local to the container so i would do tilde do 188 labs basics podman index.html2 and i need the container so basics podman server and i remember the syntax is the colon there and then it's var www.html. Cool, oh, that seemed to have worked. Let's check. Six, you see it live refresh. We're gaining on it. We have two left to go. So now, what it wants me to do is start another container. We can do that. We just did. So if I do podman run dash d for an attached name is basics podman client. Cool. And then network is lab, oops, equals, equals lab dash net. And it's detached. That's the name. That's the network. Don't do anything else. Nope. Just registry.otp4.example.com, UBI8. Cool. Now that we've already, you see how fast that was? Because we had already pulled that base image down onto our local host here, that container spun up like that. That's how quick you can get into containers, right? And so now if I actually go over here, I see that I've passed my lab and I can actually run the cleanup script to finish everything, right? So I'm graded, I passed, we love to see it. I was able to play with some containers in a very safe place in a very safe way. And now I can go on to the next chapter. And that's just an example of sort of what you can do in the Red Hat Learning Subscription with just one course and really just one lab within one course, right? There's so much more to learn about OpenShift from a developer and from an administration point of view that you can use the Red Hat Learning Subscription to help you achieve, and I really hope you do. And with that,
that brings us to the close of our planned presentation. And we've got roughly five minutes left for Q&A. Um, so I will hand it back up uh, to, to our fierce colleagues and myself, um, and we'll kind of answer your questions that came through in the chat. So it looks like there's not any questions in the chat right now, Wes, but um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in. Um, we have about four minutes we allotted for questions, so that open. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Colleen. I'll be happy to hang around. Yeah, if anyone has questions, please feel free to throw them in there. Um, I know that was a lot of material pretty quick, so definitely happy to answer anything and happy to stick around until two. Got a question came in from uh, Jamal. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me okay? I know if you can't tell, uh, that was a recording because I'm in a different location today, so I wanted to make sure uh, things would work. Um, so thank you, Colleen, for the thumbs up. Uh, what's provided in the premium subscription that's not in the standard one for RHLS? That's a really great question. Our premium tier of RHLS includes live uh, courses, effectively. Um, they're just done on a schedule, right? So there will be a schedule released for the quarter of all courses that will be live within RHLS Premium, and they're delivered in four-hour increments or three-hour increments. It's three or four. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. Um, over a period of a few different days, so it's it's chapter-based. Um, so it's a way to sort of take in training in a much more you know shorter sort of format for live modality. Um, the other thing that's really cool about it is if you're in the middle of taking a course and you realize you were struggling with just like a single chapter. Uh, you can jump into just that chapter in a live session with an instructor, listen to them sort of teach it, be there and ask questions and sort of get help. So that's the main uh, differentiator there. Question. And again, please feel free to throw questions in the chat or the Q&A, wherever is totally fine. I'm keeping an eye on both of them. I know where folks are, are dropping off that don't have questions. If you do drop off, thank you for your time today. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope you're inspired to, to get an, a Red Hat Learning subscription if you don't have one already. Yeah, it looks like there's no other questions, Wes. Um, oh, there's one. Good questions. So. The developer subscription does include some of the courses that are in standard. It's like a subset that's targeted specifically for developers. So it's not going to be every single course. It's a parsed down version of the subscription. Um, is a premium subscription necessary for working through certifications such as the RHCSA? Necessary? No. Um, if you want that live instruction that we were just talking about before with the last question, then yes. But um, otherwise, you know, if you're someone who's comfortable taking classes, you know, with, with videos and textbooks and sort of working through things on your own, um, standard would work just fine. Uh, the main thing is you're, you're looking for a tier with the exam uh, vouchers uh, as well as a tier that sort of has all the classes you're looking for. So great question. Colleen, if you say there's no more questions, I bet you someone will post another one. <laughs> Last chance for questions. Um, and if you didn't get, if you think of a question um, in maybe the next 10 minutes and we're off, again, I'm gonna send you an email for myself asking for follow-up and you can always ask those questions and I can pass them along to Wes to get those answers for you. Definitely. Cool. Well. Thank you all for coming. Again, you're going to see an email from myself and hope to see you at our next webinar. Thanks again, Wes. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one.